We won big, then we won again, then we won some more. So what exactly did the Supreme Court do for religious freedom? I'm Stuart Shepard, and this is First Liberty Live. Thanks for keeping up with our organization's activities through this program. If you haven't already, we encourage you to to subscribe on FirstLibertyLive.com. Just look for the subscribe button. Or if you're a YouTube kind of person, you can subscribe to our live channel there. And that way you can keep up with each of these episodes as they're released. Uh, It makes it so much easier to keep track of everything. My friend and colleague Kelly Shackelford is president, CEO, and chief counsel here at First Liberty Institute. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Stuart. I want to talk about the the big win we had last week first and just summarize it for everyone thanks to god's favor the landscape for religious freedom has really changed in this country and we're going to talk about three different cases that were before the court as well as uh the nature of the court itself before we're done uh today first we want a unanimous decision at the court in favor of uh, our faithful carrier gerald groff he worked for the post office he has a sincerely held religious belief he really wants to honor the lord's day by being off on sundays they gave him a religious accommodation for a time then they started scheduling him on sundays over and over again he kept telling them i can't work on sunday they'd schedule him again they'd write him up he got called into all kinds of meetings that were not fun and finally he left he wanted the supreme court and they said you can't do that and they changed the standard what does this mean? How does this impact people far beyond Gerald and his work schedule there in Pennsylvania? Well, it's, a, it's really beyond our wildest imagination that we would change a 46-year precedent with a 9-0 decision. I mean, that really is somewhat mind-boggling, but that's how clear it should have been for the last 46 years. And people look at Gerald and they think, oh, that's really good. I like this guy. He's being faithful, you know, and I want him to have his Sabbath and not be forced to violate, you know, his beliefs. But it's it's much bigger. What they just did is they changed the standard for every American in every situation. I mean, this wasn't, oh, we're changing the standard for religious freedom protection in Sabbath cases. Right. This was... You know what? We haven't been protecting religious liberty in the workplace. The law says you're supposed to. It's actually a a strong standard of protection that basically in Gerald's case, they would say the only way we don't accommodate your religion, this is what the law would say, is, is if there's a substantial cost to the entire U.S. Postal Service if we accommodate him. Why? Because we really value religious freedom. Can you get somebody else to work for Gerald? Maybe it costs a little overtime. Can you do that? Yes. If it costs overtime, are you off the hook? No, you still have to do it. We value religious freedom. So this, people look at it and they think it's just about Gerald. And God bless Gerald. We still have to go back down to the district court and take this new standard and and finalize it. So Gerald still got some endurance to go through. Yeah. But this win, the precedent, it affects every person who works your kids, your grandkids, whether they're going to be able to work at a woke company in the future. Because what this does is all these woke companies have been crushing people of faith. They now can't do that because there's religious freedom protection when they say, you have to go do this thing that violates your faith. They say, no, I I can't do that. And the burden is on them or they're in violation of federal law. So this is a huge shift for religious freedom in the workplace for our kids, our grandkids, for the future of the country. Gerald was here last week, and we were right next to him when this came down, and it was fascinating watching the emotions, the roller coaster of emotions that that happened in that moment, because the first thing we heard was it's unanimous. My initial thought was, oh, no, because <laughs> yeah. usually if it's unanimous, it means it's going to be a very narrow ruling. It affects Gerald and nobody else. But then you got reading, it's like, no, 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 this this changes the standard. Yes. Well, then it was like, yay, we won. But then Gerald read, oh, but it's got to go back to the district court. And he's like, oh, no. But that's actually the way the process works, that it last is. part, right? It is. We knew if you change the standard, then you don't just reverse the court below because they, they never had the opportunity to apply the correct standard. Right. So now we'll go down with Gerald having his full protection, and we're very confident we're going to win. But that's still more time Gerald has to go through. But you know what? Gerald's never been doing this about for Gerald. This is about him being obedient to what God called him to do. And, and the fact that he's affecting so many people of faith. I mean, there really is, I mean, there really isn't probably a single Fortune 500 company right now in the country where a person of faith can work and be outspoken biblically and think that they're going to rise. Yeah. The woke 
kind of approach, this, this we have a new idea and we want to force you to believe like we do. Um, we're getting ca lots of cases, right? We got the Klosterman case with Alaska Airlines. We just go on and on. They now have protection. And every person now in the future can work at these places. You can't force them to violate your faith. You can't force them to, to do things that, you know, maybe you're in now but are not in if you follow scripture and you're you're a, a believer or you know it could be any faith it gives them protection now because we value religious freedom in this country and so this is i mean it's, i mean kennedy was huge right changed a 50-year precedent um gonna affect how the government interacts with religious freedom it's going to restore religious freedom in a in a public way across america but in some ways this might be bigger because this is everybody who works this is not just coaches, it's not just teachers, it's not just interacting with government. This is everybody who tries to make a paycheck and, and pay for their family. They now won't have to choose between their faith and their work, and we were getting closer and closer to that being the decision people were going to have to make. And good companies are going to have to rewrite their HR policies, they're going to have to retrain their staff, right? Absolutely. I mean, every HR director in the country is going to have to revamp everything because now there's a new level of respect and, and really just following the law to protect religious freedom uh, of, of their people. And so uh, the same problem we're experiencing after the win in Kennedy is going to be here, is that people won't know that there's been a change. Right. So we're going to really have to educate people. It's different now, right? You know, if you're if you're told you, you have to go and march in the company gay pride parade. As part you know, of your work. Yeah. You, you, you say, you know, look, if you have a religious objection to participating in that, you have that right. You have that protection under the law. And that is going to provide you protection. So it's not just, you know, Gerald or Orthodox Jews on, on their Sabbath or, or Seventh-day Adventists or the, those cases for the Sabbath. This is so much broader. It's going to affect pronouns, right? You have to call him by her. You have to do that. You have to use these words. And, and there are many believers who are like, I can't say what you're asking me to say because it's not true. And, and it's, it, you're asking me to violate what I know to be true. They're going to now all have protection. And so there's a multitude of situations where this will apply. So this is a 46-year precedent just completely flipped, really, in a way that's going to protect religious freedom in the workplace uh, in a way we haven't seen in 50 years. What I hear you saying is, uh, for companies that get it, they're going to understand what the new standard is and religious freedom will be accommodated yes. more in the workplace. For those that don't, now the law is on the side of the employee yes. and it will be much easier to defend them. We ought to win quicker and lower in the court system because the courts will say, hey, there's just nothing here because this is what the Supreme Court and says. And it's, it, it's, it's like a great, huge decision, like a landmark decision. Yeah. But we know now we're going to have to work this out in a lot of other situations. So we will have the companies that either are intentionally uh, dumb or, or just <laughs> don't understand the law. Yeah. And we're going to have to nail all those situations. You know there's going to be a number of these pronoun cases and these, these attempts to force people to do things that are against their faith outside of the Sabbath context that we're going to have to, to, to really lay the boundaries in the landscape to, to then have more clarity. But we're moving in the right direction, and this is a really strong day. I mean, it, if you had asked me six years ago what two, what three cases um, would be the most significant to have a major victory at the Supreme Court to change. As far as undoing precedent. Un undoing bad precedent. It would have been Lemon, number one. Smith, number two. And I do think we're going to get rid of Smith within the next five years. Yeah. And this case, TWA, TWA versus Hardison, which was the one who was totally corrected in this case, that would have been the third one. The idea that this is all happening so quickly is really a, a, an incredible blessing. I mean, it's a move of God, and every American's getting more religious freedom. And we said that last year, but it's really true. Every American is, is right now has more religious freedom than they've had in their lifetime, and we keep getting more victories to open up these areas. 
if people will just understand they now have these freedoms. Another uh, area where this fight continues, it has to do with, we, we, we're all familiar with the acronym now, LGBTQTIA+, because there are more letters that come after that. Um, and, and those challenges keep hitting people over and over again, especially those who are in a, a creative industry, whether it's photography or a florist or a cake maker, or a, uh, in this case, a website designer. Our friends at ADF brought a case for 303 Creative out of Denver, website designer who does wedding websites, and she filed saying, I've got a problem because Colorado state law says you have to provide these websites for all, including those that your faith won't let you do. So she challenged and she won at the Supreme Court 6-3. Yeah, you know, I, we were expecting it. Um, and the reason is that case was appealed. So was our sweet cakes. Yeah. Very similar cases appealed. And we'll talk about it in a minute. When they took the 303 creative case, there were religious liberty claims and there were free speech claims. Mm -hmm. And they only took the free speech claims. Okay. And when they did that, we were like, okay, I think I see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. They're going to protect free speech. They're going to, they're, the Smith case, which would be if they'd have taken on the religious freedom versus LGBT conflict directly, um, they weren't ready yet. And so that's what that says to me. They were going to, but we felt very confident they were going to rule in favor of free speech. And it's a really good <clears throat> opinion. Uh, it's an important opinion. It will go way beyond just people of faith, obviously. But in this case, what it says is, we can, the government can't force you to say things you don't want to say, express things you don't want to express. I mean, and this is one of those deals that, as a civil rights lawyer, I just, I don't even understand the people. Yeah. I mean, because it's, it's like, do you want the government to be able to tell you what you have to say? And it's so short-sighted, the thinking. It's like, well, I want the government to tell you what to say. I just don't want them to Well, you know what? Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. When you give them the power, you give them the power. And so the same government power that could force, uh, you know, somebody to create or celebrate a gay wedding is the same power that could punish a, a black baker for not doing a Klan cake, uh, could punish, you know, a gay baker for not doing a, you know, anti-gay cake. I mean, it, it, you don't do that in this country. People have a right to express what they believe. The government can't put words in their mouths and force them to say things or punish them. And so this is a really important victory. The sad thing to me is that it was 6-3. It yeah. uh, should have been 9-0. It just shows the problem we have with some of our justices that want to be legislators or, uh, 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 or push their own beliefs on others versus freedom and the First Amendment. But it is a very important victory for everybody uh, of faith, uh, especially because now the government can't force you to say things that you can't say because of your faith. Or whatever group is in favor with the government that's right. at a point in time. And that's uh, you've said it so well because it comes down to that idea of can one person use government to force another person to say something that makes it sound like they agree with the first person. Right. And that's just not how America works. We're supposed to have different opinions, be able to express those opinions, and be able to live freely even though we disagree that's and right. disagree strongly. We still need to be able to work and live alongside each other in this culture. That's what e pluribus unum really means. I mean, that's what the founders intended when they when they coined that. Um, the the ruling that led to a favorable outcome for 303 Creative also led to a favorable order for Aaron and Melissa Klein. Yes. The, the court did an odd thing because they take thousands of cases every session, thousands, and they only deal with dozens. But the Klein case, they they held. Yes. And they held and they held. And, you know, they're turning away thousands of other cases, but they just held that one to the very end of the term and then issued this order. Put that in context for us. What does that signify? We knew when they when they took the case, when when I, we sent the Klein case up and they held it. Yeah. We knew they were holding it for 303 Creative because Aaron and Melissa have the, an exact claim, a free speech claim, just like uh, 303 Creative did that they were being they were punished because they would not express what they didn't want to express and and by the way in all these cases 303 creative Aaron and Melissa they served everybody they didn't say we're not going to serve you because you're you know gay or anything else they served everybody and in this everybody. case the client that 
did not get a same-sex ceremony cake made had been a client of theirs before. Right. They didn't turn the person away. They turned away the event, and that's so crucial. They were us. asking them to express something. Yeah. To, you know, you can't. And one of the arguments made by Colorado in the case was, well, you know, um, when people are paying for it, it makes it commercial, and then we, the government, can be involved in telling you what you can and can't say. Yeah. Oh, so somebody who writes a book and sells it, now the government's controlling their speech. Yeah. Somebody who's doing art, now the government can tell you how to... I mean, this is just insane where they were trying to go here. So this is we knew they were holding this for the free speech case. We felt like it was going to be a victory. And the only question at that point was we didn't know... You know, we were hoping the court would then vacate the second bad decision from the Oregon courts below. Yeah. Uh, and and we were hoping we knew it was against sort of the odds, but we were hoping they would say, and we're not going to force Aaron and Melissa to go back down to these same people for the third time who are obviously have a real problem with the Constitution. Yeah. But we knew that the probability was once you reset the standard, reset the law, you you sort of give them the chance to get it right. Yeah. This will be the third time. Well, and they reset the standard with the Jack Phillips case. Yes. And Oregon still kept the fine. Well, they lowered the fine to 30000 right. They said, we'll negotiate here. Yeah. It's now cost $30,000 <laughs> to say no. That's right. And, and the Supreme Court said, no, now we're going to issue 303 Creative and send it back again. Now they've got to look at that standard. Do you think they'll change? I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, I hope they will. Um, I think Aaron and Melissa have been through over 10 years of this, and I think you know, they're, they're not giving up because their precedent affects a lot of other people and, uh, and, and they're gonna stay through to the very end. But man, it's hard, it's a long time. And so we're gonna win, uh, however long it takes, we're gonna win. Aaron yeah. and Melissa are, are not backing down. And uh, in fact, one of the great pieces of news to some people who don't know it is, Aaron and Melissa finally just said, we're going to go to a place where we can be free. They moved to Montana. <laughs> They've opened a bakery, and it's actually bigger than what they had before, and people are eating there, and uh, they're doing great. Yeah. Uh, but That's good to hear. They still have been in a long battle, and anybody who's been in litigation, it's, it's, it's very internally difficult. And uh, pray for them, and pray that uh, we get a final decision that adds even greater precedent. We might even, I mean, who knows, right? If they do mess this up again, and we go back up to the Supreme Court, this might be the case that gets rid of Smith. Maybe they take the religious claim instead of the free speech claim. Right. We don't know God's what he's doing with this, but we know that Aaron and Melissa uh, have been going through this a long time. So it's a victory, but it's not over. <laughs> so they still, still have a battle ahead that we plan to win. I, I want to underscore something you, you were talking about early in this part of the discussion, and that is we're not talking about restaurants. We're not talking about car sales. This is about creative expression. Right. So a lot of headlines that I saw made it sound like the you know Christian website designer can refuse service. Well, that's not it at all. No, no. It's, you know, this is part of what the dissent tried to do. Yeah. Um, it, it shows how extreme unfortunately some of these liberal justices are in the 303 creative case there was a stipulation in other words both colorado and 303 creative agreed their lawyers had a document that says we both stipulate that the facts are that 303 creative would serve anyone yeah they just could not express you know this so they agreed Service, no discrimination on the basis of service. You wouldn't know that from the headlines. But yet, that's what the dissent said. Yeah. The dissent is like saying, well, this is about discriminating against. And you're like, in service, and you're like, you know, it was stipulated. And, and so they, they had to change the facts to make it from what they are to make it more comfortable to them for them to argue what they were arguing. Because really what they were arguing is... Uh, people shouldn't have First Amendment rights to say things that we don't like them saying. Yeah. And they knew how embarrassing a position that is. So that's that led to intentional confusion, both in the opinion and in some of the headlines. But it's been, you know, the majority, Gorsuch, responds back to that. It says, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Here are the facts. You know, uh, you, know it, you, you can't change the facts, especially when the party that you're on their side agrees I stipulated those facts. So, yeah, this is in all of these cases. You know, you go back to all the cases that you've seen in public. 
all these Christian people, not surprisingly, served everybody, loved everybody. You just can't force them to express things that violate their faith. And that's where the, the hang-up is. And now we have that protection for people around the country. It's so important for organizations like ours to work in harmony with other organizations that also work in this field. And we did a, a friend of the court brief, an amicus yes. brief, on behalf of Aaron and Melissa Klein in 303 Creative. So we were active on that case as well. That's that's why I called that a win for us as well, because we had a hand in that. Absolutely. And and we, we put before the court Aaron and Melissa again in that brief and said their case is still going. Yeah. So uh, so they're aware, and we'll see. I mean, we'll see how, what God has in, intended. Maybe we're going to get a, a quick, strong victory for Aaron and Melissa. Maybe God has bigger plans, and maybe we'll be back with something even bigger. There's something that especially people who are focused on the issues that we're focused on, both religious freedom issues, also pro-family issues in general, pro-life issues. We get this sense that the court is always fractured. There's the conservatives and the liberals, and they're, they're always at odds with each other. It's 5-4, it's 6-3, it's that kind of thing. So I, I want to deal with that a bit, because we've been hearing a lot from politicians on the left lately saying the court is fractured, that it's broken. Uh, we've seen senators stand out in front of the Supreme Court and, and threaten, literally, the justices on the court, and, and they proposed, you know, all these fake ethics claims against them and whatnot. When you look back at how the court divvied up, how they divided on decisions this session, what do you see? Is it really that fractured? No, it's, it's, it's untrue. Uh, most of the decisions were unanimous, you know? I mean, a larger percentage of unanimous decisions than they even had last term. Yeah. Um, and even when there were splits, the, it was very rare that they were split amongst the conservatives, the liberals, 6-3. And I found this when I clerked uh, right out of law school for a federal judge. I found that, you know, my co-clerk, who was a, a, a liberal person from Harvard, um, that we agreed on what the law was, you know, 95% of the time. Yeah. It was really rare. I mean, the law is the law. What it says is what it says. And... Uh, and so that's what you find the justices doing. You find them disagreeing at times, but when they disagree, there's like a mix of people on both sides. And so what you, I think, in fact, uh, you know, if you if you tried to find like who Thomas was pairing up with, you know, you'd find it was it was like, you know, Jackson. On occasion. <laughs> you know, so you're like, whoa. And, and so when, when you look at it, there's only a few of these cases, these hot button cases, where you have this 6-3. And, and it was the, the couple, two or three cases right at the end of the session. And, and that's what makes uh, the more leftist extremist people angry. They, they had used the court for, as like a mini legislature for the court to do what it couldn't do through the legislative process. And so the court was doing things to, to, to push things that weren't in the Constitution. And they're frustrated now that they can't do that. And in, instead, they should say, you know, we're going to have to win the hearts of the American people if we're going to get these policy provisions through. Yeah. But they can't do it anymore. And so they're, they're, there's a wing that is incredibly radical, that is got a lot of money, and they have made a clear decision. I mean, there's been articles, uh, an article even today that I just read in the Washington Post about how they are upping the pressure on the administ Biden administration. There were 30 progressive groups that met that said, we have to change the court. We have to expand the court, meaning like court packing. Uh, we, if you watch all these ethics charges, mm -hmm. um, they're bogus. They're just news articles. None of this is real. It's just news article after news article. And the, and the publications behind it, there are dossiers that are coming out that this is all being funded by them, but you, if you didn't know it, you would see 25, 30 articles a day attacking the court because they want to delegitimize the court, which some of the polling shows they've had some success with delegitimizing the court, but mm -hmm. they want to do that so then they can remake it in whatever image they want. And this is incredibly dangerous. This is why we had the Supreme Coup campaign to make sure people understood the importance of the independence of the judiciary, about how court packing is how you lose your country and you lose the rule of law. The great news is we just uh, used some of our money to do some polling just recently, and America doesn't like th these ideas. They are against uh, court packing. They, they are against these attacks on the court. They are against the whole idea of Congress creating ethics 
rules for the justices because they know that violates the separation of powers and yeah. it would have the Congress taking over the court. So the good news is the country is with us. There's just a lot of money and a lot of energy that we're going to see now coming against the court and trying to change the court. And really, there's nobody out there defending the justices. And so we've, we've got to do what we can to keep our, our system that we have. And that's why SupremeCoup.com, we've revamped it. And we're going to use it as a place to update people. And we're going to try to get millions of Americans to sign on to the Declaration of Judicial Independence. And we've already got over a half million, but it's a great way to educate friends. So everybody watching this, it's a great way you can educate other people. We have like tools at that site where you can easily, you know, put it in, a, in your social media or talk about it or, what, or point them to articles because most people don't even understand what's going on right now. They just see an article here and there. They see somebody criticizing the court and it's fine to criticize decisions. But to say the court is, you know, rogue or the court is, as the president said, out of whack. Yeah. And to say that, you know, to stand on the steps of the court as the majority leader of the Senate and threaten two of the justices, uh, to have people marching in front of their homes. Which is illegal. To, which is illegal. And then not allowing, not having the police or anybody do anything to enforce that. Of course, there was going to be an assassination attempt on Kavanaugh. These are all attempts to because they they're frustrated that they can't control the court uh we've got you know and, and it's kind of weird it's kind of like people in the military they can't really defend themselves you know they're in a, a structure well the justices can't really defend the court structure very well because they're in it right and so it's up to the american people just like in 1936 and 37 when the president at that time fdr tried to push court packing it was the American people that stood up and said, no way. And that's what's got to happen now. So far, we've had success, but this is really dangerous. This is one of those things that, you know, may, people might think, well, I don't think they're going to win. But the problem is if they do, it's over. The country's over. And so we've got to do our part to educate people to understand this is not a political issue. This is an issue about really having freedom because you, you'll lose all your freedoms if you lose our court system. Because I work here, and you know, you're just down the hall, basically, I forget that you're one of the leading experts on the Supreme Court in the country. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> but I forget that. I want to give you, you taught law for a decade plus uh, at the college level. Help us understand how the judiciary is fundamentally different according to the founders' view of the country, vision for the country, compared to the executive branch and the legislative branch. Because most of us don't really think in those terms anymore, but it's so important to understand this debate that we're talking about to understand how the judiciary is supposed to be different. Yeah, well, you know, number one, if you look at the Constitution, there's Article One, Article Two, and Article Three. Those are the different branches of government. Mm -hmm. They're separate, okay? They're, they're, the, um, uh, you know, you don't have the political parties controlling the courts. The courts have to be independent. Now, what's great is the, the country understands this. The last poll that was done that we did, 91% of the country said that the independence of the judiciary is crucial. It's the whole thing with Lady Justice with the blindfold on. I mean, so people understand these concepts because even if they don't understand all of the things in civics and people don't even know what's in the First Amendment, most people do understand that they want their judge and their justices and their courts to be impartial, to be independent, to, to not be controlled by politicians. Yeah. And most people quickly understand that when you have a court that's controlled in any way by politicians, then what you have now is some sort of banana republic. And that's what's happened in Venezuela. That's what's happened. And we put all this out in the Supreme Coup, the history. And so, so this is... This is basic, but I, the good news, Stuart, is I do think Americans get this. And so what they are attacking here is really, really dangerous because if you lose it, you lose everything. But I do have hope in the American people. I just think they don't know. They don't even know the court's under attack. Yeah. You know, now we're, we are uh, cataloging every day all the attacks we're seeing in the press. 
it is huge. Oh, it's number, huge. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're, we're seeing, it's not like one article, you know, 20 articles a week. It's, it's 25 or 30 articles a day nationally. And there's money pouring through different ways of attack, including these ethics charges is the newest way, which is an attempt to have Congress control the court. Right. Um, people don't know that. So that's why Supreme Coup is important as a way. We're trying to pull all this together, let people see what's happening, and make it easier for people to tell their friends. Because I think people believe the right thing in their gut. They just don't understand what's happening. And so that's our job is to pull that together. And we're going to be doing ads, and we're going to be getting stuff out. We're going to spend, you know, millions of dollars trying to make sure we keep our courts because this is important. There are specific efforts right now. I mean, article today in the Washington Post about the importance that this radical group and how they're pressuring the administration to expand the Supreme Court and the lower courts. They want to add 200 judges on the lower courts so they can take over the lower courts politically as well. And it's very clear that one of the parties is making this, it, this is my observation, just looking at it as someone who's been around this a long time, they're making it a campaign issue going into the presidential election. So whenever people see these articles and see all these claims, just kind of know that in the back of your head, because yeah. that kind of diffuses it a bit when you realize this is a, now a campaign issue, and they think it's a winner for them. We'll, well see what and this is, this is the thing, when we started the, the anti-court hacking campaign, a majority of Democrats were actually in favor of it. By the time we had finished the campaign, this is a year ago, yeah. uh, it was under 50 percent. It was 40-something percent. So Don't you understand. It, so it's just, Demo no Democrat really wants this if they understand what's going to happen. Yeah. It's not like you get control of the courts. It's the, the country's over. I mean, you're now a banana republic because you don't have a court. They're controlled by politics. Whatever rights you treasure are gone because it's just political power that controls whether you have those rights. So this is a very dangerous thing. And we can educate every American. If we can educate them, I think we'll stop this. But there is a lot of energy, a lot of money. And you can see why. I mean, they, you know, they, they're, they're not able to use the courts for their mini legislature. And, and you know, uh, they need to be educated. But in the process, if, if we don't stop them, uh, the damage will be damage we can't repair. I've heard you say repeatedly, because I get to be on the road with you on occasion, and the fact that we've had all these cases and victories at the Supreme Court over the last, really, 12 months, a couple of years, uh, going back to Bladensburg a few years, you always use this term. You always say it's God's favor at work. And I know you mean that because I've heard you say it. I know your heart. I want to give you a chance just to look into the camera here and thank our supporters for being part of these victories, because they are also part of God's favor on this organization, allowing us to do this work. Amen. Uh, yeah, just, you know, I would just say I've been doing this for 34 years, so I, I have a long perspective in this arena. And what's happening right now is not normal. It's not even historic. It's like never happened in our history. So it's not like, oh, yeah, you know, this is like a, one of those history marks. This is, this is a move of God like we've never seen in opening up religious freedom. I mean, in just 12 months, we now have three landmark wins at the Supreme Court, two of which changed 50-year precedents. One opening up religious freedom in the workplace, one opening religious freedom in society and in government and with schools, with everywhere else. I mean, this is just, uh, it's really unbelievable and I just don't know how to get that across <laughs> to people, but I just want you to realize what's happening now. And so everybody who was a part of this, if you were a part of this through prayer, through finances, through telling friends about what's going on involving them, thank you. You are a part of changing the future of the country, and you are a part of a great move of God, which has just started. I don't know where this is heading. I just know that what I'm watching right now is is beyond anything I ever even imagined, imagined or hoped. Um, it really is incredible to watch what's happening. And I just say, if, if you're new, uh, jump on board and come on for the ride. If, you're, if you've been around, get ready for some more. I mean, we've got, gosh, a number of major cases out that have been argued that we're waiting on opinions right now, including the Navy SEALs case. I think there's more to come. I think there's a lot more to come. So thank you for making a difference. And this is not just making a difference for the clients, for Gerald, for Coach Kennedy, for you know the Christian schools and the school choice case. 
this is really making a difference for your own kids and your own grandkids and, and really everybody else in the country. But just uh, it's been fun. This is a fun time. Thanks for being uh, totally a part of everything we're doing. That's a saying we have over here in marketing. This is the fun part. Yes. <laughs> it's busy, but it is fun. Kelly, I appreciate you. Thank you for de dedicating your career to this. It's so fun watching what's been accomplished over these years, and it's great getting to work here with you. Thanks well, for what you do. Thank you, Stuart. All right. And our work continues. You know, we are now working more cases each year than ever in the history of the organization. And that means more opportunities for victories like the ones you just heard about. If you'd like to be part of that, we invite you to be uh, to know that these victories are part of your work in the world and part of what you're getting done. Just go to FirstLibertyLive.com. Up at the top of the page is a big red give button. Uh, thank you in advance from all of us here at First Liberty. Uh, you are a part of this and we are grateful for you. First Liberty is fighting for what matters most.